Hello and welcome to episode 67 of the Roger Report podcast. We are back after a, a pretty mental Easter weekend. I am your host, James Copley, and I am joined by Roger Report resident Alan Brazil lookalike oh. Connor Bromley. Hello. That's harsh. Alan Brazil is actually bald and is far fatter than me. <laughs> you are balding though. I'm glad you didn't say I was fat though. <laughs> I'll take being bald and I'm not quite fat yet. I mean, 18 balding I, I, star. Yeah, I put on a wee bit of weight, but I'm not quite in the... You wouldn't point at us across the street and say he's a fat bastard. So. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. You quite a, a nice word. Thanks. No problem. I'm sure Beth agrees. Oh, definitely. Definitely. We are joined as well by Johnny Goldsmith. Yeah, all right. Spark FM is Johnny Goldsmith. Yeah, how are you doing? Heart FM. Spark. Oh, he does heart as well. Does he? I do heart as well, yeah. He's, yeah. he's the one who does Captain. the, this is heart. No, he doesn't really. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we are also joined by the main event today. We have Mark Egan of Cult 1990 Sunderland fanzine, It's the Hope I Can't Stand. Mark, how are you? All right, sir. Not too bad. Um, would you just catch, shall I tell the readers uh, a bit about yourself and, of course, the uh, Ethics fanzine, as it was known? The readers. Yeah, well, we um, we kicked off back in 1997. It was a reaction to the relegation then. Um, seems heady days given that uh, we were about to move into a new stadium with crowds growing and finishing seventh in the Premier League. But uh, I was so annoyed that we got relegated that uh, we decided we would do something about it in the, in the days when that's the sort of thing you would do. Um, and uh, me and Nick Wiseman and a, a gang of other people set up uh, set up It's the Hope of Constant. We used to flog it outside of all sorts of uh, grounds like Stockport and places like that around the country. And um, we lasted for 17 issues until we ran out of things to write about, really, because... Um, we were finishing seventh in the Premier League and we had uh, Kevin Phillips and uh, and players of that calibre. And um, yeah, we just hadn't anything to moan about anymore. So we're, It's amazing we're, that you managed to have that go on uh, 20 years ago and even now that, that is a big phrase that really... Yeah, I wish, I wish I'd uh, come up with it. I didn't. It was one of our colleagues who <laughs> did it, uh, who, who just came out with it in a pub. And um, I think it's a famous quote from somewhere, but um, she came out with it in the pub and we were like, right, that's it, we'll use that. And it's, uh, it has it really worked. It is very worked. apt for just... My time in following Sunderland, it's it's always the hope. They did it. They did it really with the derby game, didn't they? They, they offered you that little yeah. grin and then <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, hit you back down. I was sure we would be, that was it. Relegators, League One. I'd, I'd kind of completely resigned to it. At least I thought I had. And then we got that result, mm. and I was immediately thinking, well, a couple of more results. We're going to finish fourth. Could be fifth bottom. Could be sixth. Never know. <laughs> Next season, I'm looking at the championship, and I was like totally invested in the fact that we're going to stay up. And then that didn't last very long, obviously. It never does, unfortunately. Right, we'll jump into a three-word review of the terrible defeat, really, to Sheffield Wednesday. Uh, Vito Soros says, kill me now. Paul O'Leary says, fuck off camp. <laughs> Kyle Tate says, relegation is on. Mobile Mackham says, make it stop. Paul O'Leary again says, fully expected it. Lee Taylor, why, why, why? SAFC North Yorkshire, I've had enough. David, that's it down. Matt Barker, Cock Piss Partridge, Tom, Al- Tom Albrighton, Camp is AIDS. Alf <laughs> Bibby, can't defend crosses. Mark Carrick, reverted to type. Graham Field, defending requires concentration. Alex Campbell, someone shoot Bane. I like that. Tom Atkinson, failure to capitalise. Robbo, Lee Camp, Passenger. I'll be Easter Crucifixion Day. Mark McAllister, O'Shea and Wilson. And we'll end with Brad Dobbing, who says, Keepers, fucking keepers. Connor, what would your three-word review be on the Sheffield Wednesday game? Ooh, uh, oh, I wasn't, you haven't only throw it at me, but that uh, three-word review. Uh, uh, very, very heartbroken. Right. That's... And heartbroken is one word, isn't it? So... I would say very, very heartbreaking, wouldn't you? Or, no, I'm, you I'm, I'm, I'm actually heartbroken now. Oh, okay. As I was so, after watching the game on Friday, I was so excited for uh, Monday's game. And mm. I was really looking forward to it. I cancelled plan. I wasn't actually going to go to Monday's game, fully enough. And uh, I cancelled what I was doing. I was like, I'm going to put, I've been every game of the season. I'm going to, you know, reinvest into it. And uh, it was just. What plans did you cancel? I was meant to be covering the Blythe Spartans game for doing media duties there but they got to be 5-1 so <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was never going to have a good uh, bank holiday Monday no matter what but no I was I was devastated I, I've, I've came been to so many games this season and to be fair I was expecting defeat a lot of the times and I was kind of resigned and sometimes I would even find it funny that we were so bad mm. like I was you know so disengaged but I finally became engaged again after the game against Derby and I was I was so sure mm. we were going to stay up I, it was all the Chris Coleman stuff as well yeah. so, Johnny what would your three word review be? We're down, lads. I guess. Oh, I told you so. Like I said. <laughs> <laughs> it's four words. Told you so. There you go. Because I, 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 I don't know. I was thinking of going this game. I was kind of tempted. I hadn't been this season. Then I heard Chris Coleman's uh, 
everyone needs to be there Monday night. We need you all there support. And I was kind of tempted to go. I couldn't find cover for my show. So thankfully, I went to do the show instead. And I kind of had this feeling that we were going to get 2 0 down at half time or something and get beat. That didn't happen that way, but we still got beat 3 1. And mm. I, I knew we'd get beat. I just knew it would happen. It's mm. just so obvious. Mm. Mark, what would your three word review of the game be? I think um, totally predictable, actually, <laughs> would be it. Because although I was up for it like you, um, I'm totally invested in it, uh, like I was saying before. Actually, when you look at all this season, you know, we've not followed up any result with another result or a performance. Mm. Nil nil half time. You're sort of thinking uh, the, the panic levels are going to be rising a little bit. We concede, and you just know it's you just know it's going to happen. And also, how many times has this happened to Sunderland over the years? That there's a big game, all the hype's on. Um, Coleman's built it up, which is fair enough. I can understand why he's doing this. You know, you've got that kind of pressure and excitement. How often does Sunderland actually then win? Mm-hmm. It's just it's just predictable that yeah. like you're going to then fall flat in your face. If it was that an away a game, statistical study for, for mm. somebody to do. That's <laughs> a PhD. Well, if it was an away game, things might have been different. I think mm. it just seems yeah. to be that they're just they've, we've said this for years. They're frightened to play at home, and they're mm. not away from home. They're, they've got no fear away from home. I don't know why. It's almost like Chris Coleman should have told fans not to turn up, and then we might have played a, yes. bit, be- a bit better without some pressure. Connor, at the first half, do you think we were intense enough, and why didn't we take advantage of Chef Wed's slow start? <clears throat> Uh, I don't think we were intense enough. I mean, but we had all the uh, the fanfare of the email. Everyone got the email from mm. Chris telling them to show up and the players were going to show up. And uh, actually, I made a video for Roker Report as well and mm. I did the same thing. You know, the players will show up if we show up. And yes, everyone played average apart from the goalie. Everyone was okay, but nobody was a stand-up performer. And sort of, it looked like it was probably going to end up being a draw, really. I think it was harsh that we got beat. But the first half... I was just expecting to see them fly out the traps and you know be high press, really, really at it. And to me, it just they looked like you know everyone just put in a, a six or a seven. Nobody was brilliant, mm. and I just found that frustrating. Mm. Did we have any gripes with the team selection? Kone came in. I um, uh, sorry, Kone dropped out. He had a groin injury. Wilson came in. Was the only change from the derby win? What 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 changed between between derby and Sheffield Wednesday? Why can't we put that? kind of consistent run of games together is it just because we're not very good or I think it's I think it's partly to do with not being very good and also like a win goes to the player's head it seems to be they've always been where well, get a win oh Sheffield Wednesday they're not doing particularly well they've got nothing to play for should be an easy enough game and then they show up well they don't well they don't really show up but they well we didn't get the result we expected because you know the players just expected that we'll get the win and it never happened they're obviously very nervous at home. I think mm. that's a large part of this, yeah. <clears throat> because uh, they, they just kind of seem to to take command at home um, anymore. Um, and uh, the thing is, as well, like uh, opposing teams know that, so they're they're, they're coming out knowing exactly what's going to happen, and they're knowing that if they uh, if they just put the, you know they don't have to do anything. Let's face it, the opposition don't have to do anything. They just have to just have to not concede, let the pressure build, and something will collapse. Mm. And that happens pretty much every game. We do tend to, to shoot ourselves in the foot quite often. Um, all of the goals came in the second half as well. Um, Oviedo bullied very easily. And he's been one of our better players this season. The defence is a First half, the defence did all right. But, I mean, every time you put a ball towards the six-yard box, we don't have a goalie at the club who can, I don't know, come at it, pick it up. Because mm. all the goals were, you know, a commanding goalie, a, a, I don't know, not even his biggest fan, but a Pantillamon. You know, he would have stopped all three of them goals. Oh. And the it was just seemed to be the same thing. A ball just seemed to end up in the six yard box and somebody just put it in. You know, we were second to, to that and it it's just frustrating because we've we've known it, you know. Chris mm. Coleman, as much as I like him and I do think he's the right man for the job, you know, he had a there was a plethora of goalies he could have picked up and he's mm. decided to pick the worst one. The See, I'm worst not, one still at the club. I, I wouldn't blame Coleman outright for that because it's probably been mm. bringing in, yeah, and it's always judged in terms of Sunderland's recruitment policy of who we can get rather than or who the manager wants. So I mean, Coleman might have might may well have identified him, but we don't know. We had a lovers' tiff over um, a couple of weeks ago over whether goalkeeping was single-handedly to blame for Sunderland's relegation to League One. I said, no, probably not. You can't blame, ah, you can't blame the goalkeeper. come back round. But, <laughs> but now I'm really starting to believe because if, if we'd have had a competent goalkeeper, I'm convinced we would have, I, I we would look, have stayed up. I looked up the stats behind I mean, we've got you know the worst save percentage. I think we've conceded the most goals in the league. You know, We've got a goalie who's 
well, this season they've saved about 60% of the shots. Mm. If you just bump that up to 70%, you're talking probably another 10 to 15 points. You know, that's mm. what the, the margins are. And the amount of goals we can probably pick up five goals each that I would think I'd have a chance of saving. Mm. Never mind a goalie getting paid 15 grand a week. <laughs> well, it's like like Millwall game, for instance, them two goals that they conceded. Like, mm. They oh, could have easily been avoided. That was Reuter, wasn't it? Yeah, was, but to be yeah. fair, the Millwall keep are letting absolutely two stingers as yeah, well. Yeah, he kind of yeah. threw two through kicks, didn't he? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. you know, that's probably one of the few ones where our bad goalkeeping got away with it. But I mean, I'm not I'm not defending the keepers who are shocking. Oh, it sounds like you're going to defend books. them, though. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think you can lay all the blame on them because I think the, the defensive unit is shocking. I think, uh, you know, O'Shea... It's not his fault he's uh, 37 or whatever, but he's he's he shouldn't be playing week in, week out. And mm-hmm. he is like the standout mm-hmm. defender. Corny is massively let down the club, as usual. The entire season he's played, he's not lifted a, a finger, really, or a leg. And um, we just haven't... You can see Coleman's tried different options to, to organise the defence around O'Shea, and none of it's worked, really. So mm-hmm. I think it's a combination of a dodgy set of dodgy... It's like, which other club would have three dodgy keepers? Like three really <laughs> dodgy keepers on the books? Not just one, or like two, even. But like even in January we're going find an even dodgy keeper. It's just it's so sudden to do that. Yeah. But then you put him in front of a load of rubbish as well, mm. and it is a, a catastrophe, really, isn't it? I, so I remember like um, Gallagher. Yeah, I remember um, yeah. when seven years ago on this date was when we beat Tottenham three one, and Darren Ben scored like in the first oh, yeah. minute and then penalty, yeah. and then should have scored two other penalties as well. That was like the best game I've been. To. Anyway, the choice of goalies, you know, Craig Gordon or Martin Fulop, you yeah. know, yeah, and look at how. <laughs> And different mm. things are now. <laughs> you, you talked about the um, the defensive unit there, Mark. I wrote a piece today on the site. It should be live by the time the podcast goes up, centering around Papi de la Bodji. Mm. He's forced his way back into the, the Senegal team. His Dijon side are, I think, 11th in League One at the moment. Um, he's been part of a back five all season, playing 90 minutes. He's He's done pretty well, seems to have put his disciplinary walls behind him. You know, he's six foot four, physical. Could he have... Provided an option for Coleman this season? He didn't look interested most of the time when mm. I saw him play. Um, again, it's hard to tell, isn't it? What it, what, you, you can't keep... I don't think you can keep picking out individual players and saying it's them or they're not interested or whatever. There's something with the whole setup which makes it not work. Mm-hmm. And um, clearly they're, they're just... They've had too many players who aren't interested, too many players who wanted a way too many players who aren't really good enough for this level and it's just been a toxic combination so if you bring if you bring it's like anything i suppose if you go on to do your job you walk into a, a workplace that's sort of fairly happy and people know their roles it's a much better experience and you go in there and everyone hates each other and mm. the, the place is failing in some way maybe he's not a big enough character to have taken that on maybe he just thought i can't be bothered <laughs> you know I, I want to play somewhere else yeah yeah Connor de la Bodgy, yay on it uh, well, from what I saw, him, no, but I think mm. you look at the, the spells he's had. Well, Sunderland Sandwich in the middle, he was good before he came. He's been good mm. since he left. So, probably suggests that maybe the issue may have not been him. But you look mm. at other players, you know, Barini last year was horrendous. You know, he's one of my favourite players as well when, yeah, we, he was when we had him. But he was poor, and then now he's playing for AC Milan at, you know, well, fullback of all places. He, he's been playing poorly for AC Milan though he's, 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 I think he's quite liked in Italy because of his work rate which is, is pretty big out oh, there oh now we fell for that as well didn't in, we in terms of um, quality I, I don't think he offers much he was dropped for AC Milan played Juventus they lost 3-1 and he was dropped for that game uh, and that's why they lost there it is uh, well, the, the loss of, the loss of, <laughs> the, um, they were losing against Chievo in the game before that until Barini came off and then they managed to turn it around 3-2 and no. the the game before that was the Arsenal game in the Europa League. Barini looked very, very... You can tell he does the loan watch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look at him, he knows everything about the loan How's Kasri doing these days? Kasri just doing, con- doing continues well, to light the yeah. whole world up. Um, yeah. He's going to be playing in in a World Cup for Tunisia. I think he's got yeah. something like 12 goals this season. He's playing England, actually. Yeah, he's, exactly. He's playing a false nine. Um, fans of Rennes love him. He scored against Lyon. He scored against Marseille. Like audacious back heels. Well, and again, you just... kind of question his talent. You know, I haven't seen him. It's, to, it's not the talent. It's to be the, fair, he was wonderful under Ramos. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I liked him even last yeah. last year. I was pulling my hair out every week. Like mm. Moyes was just like, nah, I'm not going to play him. There's yeah. there's the problem. You see, I guess who wants to play for David Moyes really? Like, so Moyes Arsenal is an team. arsehole. There we are. Conclusion. That's yes. what the issue is. Yes. Yes. So yes. if they played under Chris Coleman, maybe things would be different. They might want to play for him. I don't know, but mm. too late now, I guess. We will we'll move on to um, the one positive in the match against Sheffield Wednesday and that was a great running cross by Lyndon Gooch and a good header by Rugger Report favourite George Hoodyman. No, it's good. I was 
pleased that both them players were involved. Um, you saw how much it meant to them as well. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of both players. Um, I think both could do a little bit more seasoning. As, uh, <laughs> as well, they're they're going to get that with 46 games and exactly. one next year. <laughs> but the thing is, though, they're the sort of players, you know, they're the building blocks for, yeah. I suppose, the future. I don't think, as much as I like Joel Osoro, I don't think he'll be here next year. So it's pointless, you know, sort of thinking about him being a building block. But them, you know, Mad Gen sitting in there as well. M. Bolton, who Coleman says isn't ready, but I don't get because I think he's better than a lot of what we've got. Certainly better than playing a Jaria, who's not even, doesn't belong to us. Mm. I look at them sort of players and I think that's where we're going to, you know, that's where we need to focus our future on. And I was really pleased to see them involved. And they were both lively all game. I thought they both had sevens. Mm. Of the sixes and sevens, they were the sevens. Mm-hmm. I like the, the, they both do work really hard and I think that's all we want at this point. Mm-hmm. A, a massive criticism of, of Gooch and Honeyman is that they run, a, they run around a lot but they're not really positionally aware and such like and they don't offer much. But I honestly think Half the time, they're, they're trying to cover mistakes from, from experienced teammates. I think you're probably right, but also I think we'll have to get used to that. We're not going to be in the Premier League for a few years now, so we're mm. not going to have players who are actually that great. We're yeah. And so players who run around a lot and make things happen because they run around a lot is is our stock in trade now for the mm. next year or two. Um, and there's, there's something to be said for that because they've, if they've got the right attitudes and they've got a bit of pace, um, they'll, do a, they'll do a good job for us. Yeah, I agree. Um, are there any amongst us who actually believe that we'll survive despite yesterday's capitulation no 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 silence so no from well, and no from connor i don't know i don't think so but um i've got a ticket for leeds and i, I kind of think oh you know if we win that game then we've got red and you never know <laughs> we're away from then, home so we probably will get yeah results, exactly and then, then we've got burton and yeah. us, but but realistically you look at it like obviously no but i still there's a little bit of us just can't let go of that Distant possibility. It's, it's the hope. It's the hope. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Birmingham, though, they play well be tonight. So probably Bolton. playing as you're listening to this, if you listen to it tonight. So that'll be interesting. If Birmingham win, then you know it is curtains. I don't care what anybody says. Mm. You know you're not going to win four games, and Birmingham aren't going to pick up at least four points. So it it does kind of hinge for me. I'll say we're definitively down when Birmingham pick up the inevitable win they'll get tonight. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a penalty shout for Sunderland at two one down. A big, big penalty shot. How much of a difference could that have made? Huge. I think it's the same. I mean, Catmull hit the post as well. I think just moments after that. But that was a really, really bad decision. I mean, obviously, one relegate, one relegation, one penalty decision is not what will be, mm. will not be what relegates you. But it could be a turning point. You know, if they did get that back at two two, especially after they scored straight away for the one one, then yeah, they might have went round and won it. And it's frustrating. It's annoying, but. That's not why we're going down, you know. Mm. We're going down because we've been shit from day one. Yeah, it's hard to disagree with it. Yeah. yeah. What did you make of the uh, the Gooch the Gooch penalty incident? Um. Well, I guess in terms of would it make a difference? I mean, I don't know. I mean, you still have the terrible defence and goalkeeper. So then, if they go for another attack, then there's no reason why they couldn't have made a three two. Um. I mean, it was a terrible decision by the ref. I mean, definitely should have uh, been given. But um, no, on our look. We don't miss penalties very often, but you can imagine he probably would have. <laughs> <laughs> <So, laughs> I don't yeah. know the last time we missed one, but... Um, it's years well, ago now, isn't it? The uh, cup final, oh, yeah. semi-final. But, uh, well, I remember that because Martin O'Neill was in the stands, wasn't he? Yeah, it was Eric Black was in charge. Yeah. And Ed Larson dived for the penalty, and then missed it, yeah. and then they scored straight away. I remember yeah. that one. I watched that in Riley's before Riley's got turned into a, a laser quasar. Oh, man. Nice. Oh, it's a laser quiz. Oh, it's a laser quiz. Uh, lads, what would you ask? Coleman won't admit it, but he probably knows we're down. Um, yep. Are we a fan of this mentality that he's not going to admit it? He, he'll keep fighting till the end. Or... That's the law of football, isn't it? You, you have to keep saying. There's mm. a certain set of things you have to say, isn't there? You have to say things like, we'll keep fighting until it's mathematically certain. Mm-hmm. That hasn't come out yet, I don't think, so that's one to say. Apparently, if we got beat weeks. against Derby and this game, we could have been relegated today this, after this Birmingham game, but... Uh, Kept hanging in there, have yeah, we? That's yeah, good. Yeah. We can um, get relegated a week today, but he he can't, can he? You've got to you've got to keep you've got to keep the script because mm. you can't when there's points to play for. Mm. I mean, because a lot of fans and I'd, I'd be critical actually. You know, there are actually what eighteen points to play for. I, I've lost count of the the little tracker the club keep putting out on Twitter mm. to say how many points still to be lost. You know, every uh, <laughs> every game, but until until you know, it is literally true, and we have got six games to go. They're all winnable, mm. so to cave in now would be even though we all know we're down, it would be a disgrace to You've do that. You've got to have so, somebody to be uh, keep a positive yeah. attitude. I mean, even if he probably knows in his head, that yeah, of course he's he probably not going to stay up. But like you have to. Footballers are, you know, like to be loved. And if you say, "Oh well, 
you know, keep positive. We have the ability to do it. You know, the, hopefully it'll put some confidence in the players. Um, mm. You know, we need some confidence, and if he can give that, then at least it's one person. I'm looking forward to who's doing the rallying cry this week. Oh, it'll be John O'Shea for surely. Oh, surely, it's John someone O'Shea. else in the road because he's done quite a few recently. <laughs> must be oh, a... I haven't seen a Catamore one for a while. To be fair, actually, Catamore was decent at the weekend. It's often I can say he's had two good games in a row. Mm-hmm. Oh. I was surprised by Ashley Fletcher's um, performance against Derby. We'll, we'll, we'll touch on Derby very, very briefly. Uh, we're all very pissed off because, you know, the Derby game happens and we win. Nobody expects us to win. And the Roker Report, Roker Report aren't doing a podcast until after the next game. So we miss out on the positivity. So that's, what, 11 games or 11 podcasts or something we haven't been able to talk in length about a win. I was able to do TV, though, on Saturday. So I, did, oh, right, I had something to say positive-wise. But even then, no, it's 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 frustrating. I'm so frustrated going to that. I actually watched that game in Newcastle as well in a mag bar, mm. sat like in the corner with like two of my other mag mates, um, and I was getting some deathly looks. But I mean, at the end of the day, I was like, I'm not going to celebrate. And then it got like four one. I was like, but well, I cannot not celebrate. <laughs> like, four, how many times does this happen? <laughs> um, so it was just frustrating. I was on such a high going at the 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 game on Monday yesterday. Mm. I was so excited, and then. The game started and I knew straight away, I was like, if they win this, it's not going to be because they're brilliant. It'll be because they've snuck a one or two one win. Mm. And I just found it really, not well, heartbreaking. I did. I had ideas in my head for a piece in three years' time. You know, the I watched Sunderland beat Derby from from the the from the Chaplain's pub and now in the Champions League. I was thinking, you know, <laughs> this is the turning point. This is the moment we're all going to look back <laughs> on and, and no. <laughs> no. <laughs> that time might come. Right, we're going to take a quick promotional break and we shall be back with you shortly. Hello and welcome back to part two of the Rook Report podcast this week. Um, we shall move on to the rumour mill takeover talks. Um, ALS have been very vocal with one particular group. Could it be Full World 73 again? There was a series of tweets that came out suggesting that uh, a deal could be near. What do we make of it? I, d- I don't believe it. It was April 1st, so... <laughs> it was April 1st, so I'm not, I'm, I don't believe it. Really. Well, they've come out and said it wasn't an April 1st ploy. Mm, okay. Well, we'll see what happens if, if it keeps on uh, progressing. Then, uh... I, I think, uh, to be fair, I want to believe it, and I don't believe for one minute that a Love Supreme would damage their own reputation by publishing shite. I don't think they're doing it for clicks because if you were doing that, you would have written it as an article. I still don't understand why they didn't do that, to be fair. But I would have personally written it as an article and not a really badly worded tweet for three series of three tweets, which I looked like they hadn't been proofread. Actually, mm. I don't understand. I think that there is truth You were in no position to criticise anybody's Twitter. No, if I had a professional tweet, like if I was writing something professional, I would have. Thanks for that, James. I'll take the, the hammer in there. No bother. But uh, I, I think there is truth to it because, number one, I think there's rumblings that there's a takeover happening. Like, it seems to... You know, they had the Niall Quinn story the other week. And something is happening, I think, behind the scenes. But also, I just can't believe for one minute that knowing how we would work at Roker Report, if we, we would not publish something like that, there wasn't truth to it. So I believe that there must be truth to it. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I hope something is happening. I mean, Ellis uh, Short has is, is got to want to get rid of the club. Um, so you would, you would hope he's up to something. The, the thing that surprises me or makes me wonder about these uh, rumours is... Um, he is so secretive himself. Why would how would this come out exactly? You know what's no one knows what he's thinking or what or where things are with him and his planning. So everything is just pure speculation. Martin Bain would probably come out and release some kind of letter talking about how things are yeah, happened here and the master plan, as usual. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a good bit of business or whatever it is. But mm. it's interesting though because. I think David Callahan, the comedian we had on the show last week, made the point that now is a very strange time to buy a football club. Surely you'd want to know if the club was going to be in League One or the Championship, just in terms of how much you're going to pay for it. I think, though, if it's a, if it's a locally led group, I don't think they. I mean, they've probably spent all season trying to build up to this moment of buying the club. Like I can't imagine they just decided last week that they were going to buy it. But for local businessmen, it would make more sense to wait till the end of the season to launch the bid yeah. because what league we are in dictates how much that bid is going to be. But now these things take weeks though, don't they? So, yes, so the, it, it, there could be a lot of negotiation going on. Um, I'm sure that no signature will go on a deal until it's clear what league some of them are going to be in. Mm. Uh, only have to is, wait a week for that. So. Only have to <laughs> wait a week. Uh, and there might be other things attached to it in terms of contracts and getting rid of Rodwell maybe and that kind of stuff. I don't mm. know. 
Um, that's so I, I'm not surprised that it might take a while that there'll be rumours going on um, before you wouldn't start your your discussions in May, would you? You have to start them a lot earlier. Mm -hmm. I just wonder who these people are, whether they've really got the money to invest in the club to the extent that we're going to be successful but, in the Premier League, which has got to be the long-term aim. But they're saying, though, that it's a short still going to kind of own the club and yeah. pay some bills or debts and whatnot. So really what they're doing is they're financing a, the squad to try and get them up to then buy it in a couple of years. But, I mean, it, it's difficult to know. I suppose we'll never know because even if it did happen, we'll never find out the ins and outs of the deal. Um, I'm curious to see what the accounts will be. I think a lot will become more clear when they're released at the end of this month mm -mm. and of course the Nal Quinn stuff blew away pretty quickly he came out and denied it he says he's been contacted in an advisory role about people looking at the club but it's nothing official I think he's just they've asked him for advice on how to deal with short and he's probably told them so that doesn't look like it's going anywhere unfortunately took a while or didn't it? it was an unusual length of time before he came out to speak mm. on that I thought that was and he, he only came out with an, at an event he was speaking on in Ireland I mm. don't think he, he didn't come out with a, a statement of his own the thing is so he's not doing anything for Sky Sports or anything anymore I wonder if he's just keeping a really super low profile for whatever reason mm. I mean it's you know it's interesting didn't he want to spend more time with his family when he left Sunderland and he was on Sky Sports every week yeah so well, he's like now deciding now I'll spend time with my family the thing is so Sky Sports watch just go on a Sunday I could do that yeah. <laughs> once a week on a Sunday talk about football for a couple hours easy yeah, done I guess so yeah. but I suppose for, for Quinn like you know he's a well off bloke he made, a, he made a lot of money off the club the first time around I think he's got a couple of business himself could he be asked for it I think he's in a different stage of his life and as much as I would love for him to come back I just if it's probably just for him he's done it you know he doesn't mm. want to be this constant every time it goes to shit oh we'll give Niall a ring and he'll mm. he'll sort it out it's a, it's sort of a cliche but not really at the same time but we need somebody of a Quint ilk who at least understands football I mean if we could get somebody who understands the area and the club that would be nice but we need to move away from these figures like Martin Bain like Margaret Byrne who don't understand football no, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's a, it's no, no argument about that. I mean, Bain's have been a disaster, in my opinion. I mean, he's been a disaster for the club. He's been brilliant for short because mm -hmm. he's cashed in assets left, right and centre and he's he's restructured the club exactly as short wants it. But from the club's point of view, from our point of view, he's been an absolute disaster. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the, yeah, you must, be, you must have somebody in football who's both um, good at business and can understand the game of football. Mm -hmm. uh, Margaret Byrne was always a mystery to me because she didn't seem to have any credentials either in football or out of it to have that role and that that was catastrophic what, so what you what you said there mark um interests me because i've been a a, a long-standing critic of martin byrne and i have come in for stick occasionally and an argument that's used is that martin byrne is just ellis short's man and he's, he's just doing right. as instructed but i don't think that's right anyway i often question his morality well, I think he's he's Short's man. I think he's been given he's been given a brief by Short, is my reading of it. And the brief is I put too much money in this club and I want to see it back. Mm. The parachute payments have gone back to Short. He's sold Pickford. Other people have been sold off. He's done. He's he's asset stripped basically, and that's why we've got this squad which is made up of kids and uh, loanees and uh, a few old lags who couldn't be got rid of. And he, and he has made um, massive mistakes as well in terms oh, yeah. of the goalkeeping situation that we mentioned. You see, I don't think Short cares about that at the end of the day. I mean, I think it's probably the biggest mistake is I think Shaw didn't want to see them relegated because it is taking money off the bottom line, isn't it? So it's mm -hmm. it's putting them in a position he didn't want to be. It's like any with anything else. It's it's a uh, it's run like a business, and Ellis Shaw obviously uh, he's been badly advised in the past, mm. and he's paying for it now. And I guess because he's never had a football club to one before, so this is his first stint at doing this, and so like he's obviously spent a lot of money, then realizes he needs needs to get it back. And in some ways, I mean, I'd not defend Ellis Short, but like you've. If you lose money, you want to get it back. And if he mm. has to do these things, even if it's a football club, it's still a business. He has to make his money. So it, it baffles me that Sunderland is failing as a business and has failed as a business for a long time. Yeah, Ellis Shaw <coughs> hasn't recognised what's making it fail yeah. as a business. He's continually allowed himself to be badly advised over and over again. And you would think that a man of his intelligence, he's obviously intelligent to make that much money in life, that he would be able to kind of recognise the problem and act on it. But he just... Hasn't. Well, that's it. I just I don't understand it. I don't get it because he's obviously successful at his core business activities, and uh, run the run the football club. It is a business. At the end of the day, it's not that different. And if you don't understand the business, well, you hire people in who understand this, mm. and and that's your number one job, isn't it? Is to hire in decent people, and he's consistently failed at that. And you just sort of think, what's he? 
why is he so bad at that when he's made money elsewhere? Mm. And of course, we don't know what, how he's made his money or, or what's gone on there. But it, it's it's very uh, it's again it's like on. I think I wrote about this earlier in the year. It's very Sunderland that we get a billionaire owner, but we get the only billionaire owner who who doesn't know how to run a business. <laughs> Out of curiosity, um, would you guys rather Mike Ashley? Over <laughs> general question. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I've on I've had this discussion many times with Newcastle fans. I was like, I tell you what, if Mike Ashley was gonna. If that was the person buying something, and somebody would say, "Look, he's exactly the same as Mike Ashley," I would take it because he gets them a on a financial fund. B, Newcastle have predominantly been in the Premier League since he's been there. Yeah. The ground's full every week. I know they've got Sports Direct plastered on it, but to be honest, I'm not really that attached to the Stadium Light name anyway. So you know what? Call it the Sports Direct Arena. I wouldn't care. Like I don't like the name Stadium. I, I would care if the name changed, but in terms of plastering the logo all over, go for it. If it's going to keep us in the Premier League, but yeah, I'll say uh, uh, the devil. I don't mind. I just I think, think he's a massive twat, man, and his his treatment of his own workers has been abhorrent, and his zero hour contracts are abhorrent. I mean, Short's yeah. a, obviously a more decent bloke than Ashley. That's the only know, thing. I think he is because oh, Ellis well, Short is a real estate guy who just buys the properties that have went under and sells them on. I think. Well, I say he, he seems to be a more decent bloke. Yeah, he keep, he keeps me, his indiscretions quieter. If you find me a billionaire who's made a billion billions of pounds without stepping on people, then. Fair. I'll be, I'll be sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because no, they're all like that, you know. Yeah. And I think that that's ultimately, I suppose, it. Like Mike Ashley, yes, he's been a poor owner in a lot of ways. But Newcastle fans, for me, have just got ridiculous expectations of what they expect their club to be. Historically, they've never been anything more than a perennial bottom half, top division side, which floats between the two. You know, and they've got visions that they're some sort of mm. giant who should be in the top mm. four. You know, potentials there, but the potentials there at Leeds United, Sheffield Wednesday, Sunderland. It's all them clubs, but you know they've not really fulfilled it. But there's always ten thousand fans locked out of the stadium, isn't it? That's true. Or at least, to be fair, they've got at least, at least. Yeah. But then you know what? we've got ridiculous as well. I was looking up that we've of all the teams to be relegated to uh, League One since two thousand, we've been by far the best supported to do it. You know, Leeds were playing in front of just over twenty thousand, mm. and we had like nearly thirty thousand there mm. on Monday. Right, we'll move on to Chris Coleman. Uh, we touched on him earlier. We'll have a Twitter question from Ryan Pallister. Do you think Coleman talks a good game, but there isn't much behind the words? His signings in January have been pitiful. Hands were tied, yes, but surely we could have got better than this lot. Well, why would anyone have come to Sunderland in January? Yeah. Why would anyone, why would any professional player look at Sunderland and go, i tell you what, I want to go and invest me time and energy in that club. Mm-hmm. It's an absolute graveyard for playing careers at the moment. It doesn't scream potential. <laughs> no, not really. You're walking into League One, you're going to be, you're in a team that doesn't win at home and gets slagged off every week by its own fans. It, you, you just, no, no one's going to come. People have to open their eyes and mm-hmm. look at this. Players who's coming, you know. I mean, like, uh, Luolo, I just had his contract cancelled by Brighton. Yeah, he exactly, yeah. I know. We're uh, scraping, like, barrels that have yeah. never been scraped before. And yeah. it is Aria, like, obviously, it's not going to do him any problems because he's going back to Liverpool and then, you know, he'll still have that yeah. potential that they all oh, believe he has. Yeah. He'll go somewhere else in the Championship. I'd probably play in the Champions League as Aria just because oh. that, that's a very subtle thing to happen. Mm. Yeah. The thing is, though, like, Oliver McBurney went to Barnsley and... Yeah, and he looked at Sunderland and said, I'd rather go to Barnsley. Well, that, that's so, so that tells you a lot. Though, but I it? just think, you know, if you're willing to go to Barnsley, who are in the same position as us, really, then. Well, but the, uh, because the, the fact is that I think Sunderland must have a terrible reputation now amongst the current kind of crop of mm. players. As a, as a it's a small place, world, isn't it? Football. It's a place not to touch, and that's uh, what Coleman's got to try and fix. I've made this point before is that as a, as a, a club going forward, why would a Chelsea or a Liverpool loan a young player to Sunderland ever again you know look at <laughs> Galloway was quite highly rated he's a broken man Browning <laughs> very highly rated has gone back to Everton injured you know yeah. Ajari is probably going to be scarred for life Jake Clark Salter can't play a game without getting sent off you know and this is in contrast to when we, we made Danny Welbeck and we made mm. Johnny Evans it's it's all gone it's all gone a bit sour hasn't it really so there's a massive job to do just to rebuild the club brick by brick basically for Coleman uh, in League One just to get the right characters in rebuild the dressing room and, mm. and get it into a place where people want to come to but I think the criticism I don't think he even made the January signings let's face it mm. as, as he said before you, you know Bain will have said what do you want Coleman said I want like every position that you could possibly fill and uh, bain has gone alright Lance uh, here you've got a cast off keeper from somebody you've got a couple of kids what were we after some other goalie and then Lee Camp was just the name of Pop the last couple of hours beforehand I'm sure it was like there was someone else we're after mm. it's like, oh Lee Camp oh he's a bit of a <laughs> I mean more and more dissenters have appeared 
um, after the game against Sheffield Wednesday. Yeah. Do you, should he be doing better? I honestly don't really see what I he can do. I think you can't just say that blindly that Chris Coleman is you know without blame. Yeah, he's done things wrong. He's not infallible. He did things wrong at the weekend on, on Monday's game. You know, I never saw Joel Lasora warm up. I'm on that touchline, and I don't know. Did you see Joel Lasora warm up? I was on an aeroplane, to be honest, mate. Oh, you were there, sorry. <laughs> but, <laughs> it wasn't on my aeroplane. So. <laughs> I never saw him up and I'm on that touchline and then he brings him on, you know, and I'm like, you know, yeah. 80 minutes was that the time to make two substitutions to change the game from my 3-1 down? I, I don't know if you heard, Probably there was not. a Sunderland fan on BBC Radio Newcastle. Oh, I did, yeah. Uh, saying how this guy, you know, he's sitting with his hands, stands with his hands in his pockets, having gone berserk at these players if I was 2-1 down and he's just stand there with his hands in his pockets. <sighs> Was, or his arms uh, or whatever it is. There was another guy who talked about the tactical decision he made to win his under 12s cup and that they were getting beat 3 1 and he changed it from a 3 5 2 to a 4 4 2 and the 1 4 3. It's that easy, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, the thing is, I don't, I don't think we can judge Coleman uh, at the moment. I don't. I think he's um, he's got a very difficult situation and he's firefighting the whole time, trying desperately to find a combination that'll work. And, and obviously now he's in a position where nothing's worked and we're going down. And I think it's only next season when you can see what's he, you know, who's he bringing in and what shape is he going to try and give the squad. That's when you can actually judge him. I just I don't honestly think any game we've played, you can look at it and go, that's down to Coleman. I mean, he's tried different things. He's tried different, you know, players in different positions and all the rest of it. All of it trying to get something that works and he just hasn't had a spark. I think if they if they go down, which I'm expecting they will, next year, if they're not in the promotion push by October, November, then I would say that, yeah, judge him. Because... The teams that have come down from that league, like Charlton, are in a far worse position than what we've ever mm. been in with their mm. owners owning yeah. like three teams and stuff. And they're just back in the playoffs now in League One. Like, League One is an utterly dog shit league. Well, the, yeah. the, the like, disparity it, in transfer yeah. budgets between League One and the Championship it's means huge. that even with our pitiful budget, we should have by yeah. far and away the biggest League One budget. Well, exactly. You know, got Akron and Stanley's so are going to come up into that league. That's scary. I mean, the fact that we're going to be on an even playing field with Akron and Stanley is. Hmm. is ridiculous but they that... have to think of confidence as well all players need to have the confidence to play and like if they're going down with no confidence that that's not going to suddenly change because they're in a lower division so if they get beat in the first couple of games be low confidence again no, but, he's got he's got uh, bringing a lot of players but i think <coughs> like that's no excuse like yeah, the, the thing is next year is they've got to be really they've got to finish in the top two and anything oh, yeah. less is a, a failure and this is from this point right now i don't really care what happens over the summer unless they go to administration He's got a, ch- you know, that league operates on free transfers and loans. We've got an yeah. academy set up with really good young players, and I know they're good young players because I watch them. If they are not in the top two, then that's when I would say get rid of him. Right now, you cannot really judge him. He deserves the chance to have a for three or four mm. months next year. This, this mm. is all under the assumption that Coleman will stay and a takeover is completed. Do you think there's a chance that? He could leave if Ellis Short is still around because why is he going to want to work under the same conditions? Well, in Ipswich need a new manager, and so did West Brom. So, well, you know, mm. I don't think. I, I, don't. I, I think Coleman's a man of his word. He said he will stay, and he knows the challenge he was going to come into. So, I believe that he will stay. But he knows that he could have had the West probably could have got the West Brom job over Pardew. You know, just after if he'd waited, he could have got it. He, for me, he would have left already if he was that sick and didn't want to do it. He would have already left because well, if, if Short stays. If we don't find a buyer, and he's in League One, and he's still working, and he's still probably being lied to, let's face it, because he's been—I think he's normal. Must have worked it out by now. I think Simon Grayson was told a lot of things yeah. would happen, and they didn't. And Chris Coleman was told a lot of things would I happen, think and they the didn't. The difference between them is he—is he going to want to stay if Short's still around? Yeah, I think he will because he took it. He took it knowing, and everyone knows in football it's a small world. And you're telling me that Simon Grayson didn't tell. Chris Coleman or Chris Coleman didn't hear about the will have heard about it because it is a small world football there's only what a thousand professional players there's only 92 managers you know it's, it's a small pool they're all going to talk he they're probably all in a whatsapp group chat they're probably all in a group chat <laughs> probably is an LMA group chat they're like oh fucking hell Chris what are you doing taking that job yeah, so for fuck's sake Chris you, 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 <laughs> he's, he's got a free hit hasn't he on three, three or four months as he's saying at the autumn in that uh I think well, there'll be some money to spend, and you don't need money. You just need players the right character to come in, mm. and he, he gets that chance. If he leaves after three months and we're not doing well, the whole of football they're not going to blame Chris Coleman. They're going to say Sullen, it's short, it's whatever. So he might as well try and build things up and get get the momentum going. But West Brom, you look at it and think, well, he could walk into West Brom, but aren't they going to be in the same sort of Gar- death spiral? Be Gary Monk, you know, he could yeah. be the Gary Monk next year, you know. So it's one of them. Chris- I, hope, I hope he stays. He's got a chance to mm. to be manager of the biggest team in that league. Um, 
should be shoo-ins to go up. I don't even really know. Even if they spend nothing over the summer and sell eight players, there still should be shoo-ins to go up because it's a shit league. Jack Rodwell lifts the uh, lifts the trophy at Wembley as we, um, well, as we go up through the Injures players. himself. But the, the thing is, though, is... <laughs> The players like him, though, like at that level, they should be. You know, Jack Rodwell should I'll be. See, good. I don't know. I've seen uh, Jack Rodwell. Like... I've, been, I've seen Jack Rodwell play under twenty three football and he's, look shocking. He's not playing again for sure. Yeah, he's not playing yeah, again. No, but all, all, all I mean is, is Chris Coleman's got a chance to take up next season, and it is a free swing for him. I know? mean, I don't know. Like, even if he did go, who's going to come in? I mean, you know, Pardew still hasn't finished his new contract. Mick McCarthy could come in. <laughs> Mick McCarthy, well, he could do, and he works on a shoestring budget, doesn't he? But I think. I don't know. I think his tactics probably predated. I don't know. The brain no. Work. You want to look at? I looked at that uh, when we got Coleman in. That lad who manages uh, Shrewsbury, whose name I can't remember now, but he's got quite an interesting record, and uh, he's, he's done. He's done. Well, he's done well yeah. there. And you yeah. kind of think you need someone new. You don't want to go around the merry-go-round of like people that were, you know, McCarthy was not great for us. He oh, was I our, disagree. Oh, John, we'll end up with twelve hours. Well, it's I like McCarthy. I like him. I like but him I mean, McCarthy. let's let's he not took up on an absolute. If he was given the same amount of money as Roy Keane, it would have been interesting to see what he'd done with it. Yeah, but yeah. I, I think he's he's. Getting, I think his ideas are out now. I disagree. Know. I think he's done a good job. I, th- I think mm. there's there's an argument around British managers like this, Allardyce and, and such like, and they're very good at a certain job. And Mick McCarthy would probably be great for get, getting us promoted to League One or in the Championship. But further than that, I'm not sure. Well, yeah, but you know, which what? I'd be happy with. Don't I was going to say, if if the five year plan was to have were in a position in five years time to get promoted to the Premier League, you know, I think I'd probably take that right now. Yeah, but you've got to move on. I think it's been a long time since Sunderland have had anything regarding progressive in terms of football management. I think Chris Coleman was <laughs> going to be that appointment, wasn't he? You know, he was meant to be yeah. a bit of a different yeah. sort of. I mean, he, the thing is, he's got the gift of the gab. Right, and he, that's almost getting used against him now. Like the fact that he's a good talker. Yeah, it's a bit harsh, that isn't it? Oh, he talks well, so yeah. He's <laughs> he's that, yeah. Let's have Moyes back. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, exactly. <laughs> Let's have Dowd. Yeah, right. but he does yes. have the gift of the gab, and he he has that ability. Like you know, what happened after the derby game to mm. almost galvanise yeah. everyone, and the crowd did not turn on the team on mm. Monday. You know, they stuck with it. The ground didn't empty really until about the ninetieth minute, which is mm. fair enough. And it's good so for me. I wait till the end and I avoid all the track, avoid all the traffic. It's mm. quite handy. It's one of the best things about getting be 3 nil at home every week. You can wait <laughs> yeah, at the end and sail home. Uh, we'll move on to club fan relations now. Um, the fan group Red and White Army had a meeting scheduled with um, with the club tonight. It's been postponed until the 12th of April. The club contacted the group a week ago so to tell us. Um, we don't know why it's been put back, Red and White Army say, but we live in the hope that it's something to do with takeover talks. Well, I mean, I'm hopeful. Well, it's not. It's going to be nothing to do with takeover talks, is it? It's going to be like Martin Bain and Ellis probably just don't want it to happen just yet. They'll mm. probably wait until we're relegated. Yeah, something like I think so. Yeah. Talk about oh, this is what's going to happen next season in League One or whatever. There's no takeover. <laughs> there isn't a takeover. I'm almost certain. The thing is, red in my army. For one, I don't know why it took them a week to announce this. Mm. I don't understand that. I think also I found it frustrating with them that I had quite a lot of hope for them initially, but. I kind of feel like their PRs not great. You know, the meetings that they publish, I feel I read them and I'm like, I learned nothing new. You know, it's all. But that that's not necessarily Red and White Army's fault. I'm I'm pretty well. I'm in contact with a lot of them. Michael Luff for one. Um, they ask the right questions, but it's not their fault that they get the wrong answers or the answers that fans don't necessarily want to hear. No, I, I understand that. I think it's a hard job, and you know, I appreciate the fact that they decided to take that jump, and I didn't. You didn't. You know, we all didn't decide the create that sort of group but I just don't know if what they want to achieve can be achieved with that mm. ownership well we will have a Red and White Army representative on the show next week whose name escapes me Chris Chris Weathers no not Chris Weathers Chris Thompson Chris Thompson, Chris Thompson will be on so that'll be good tune in for Thompson v Bromley uh, <laughs> we, we shall um, I'll be the referee in that Mark what do you make obviously you've been around the been around, yeah, you, yeah. You know, the the Sunderland fan sphere for a long time. Um, I'm a bit been involved uh, in it. I mean, I'm sure it's very well meaning. I'm a bit skeptical about it. I'm a bit skeptical about um, the, not not against the people personally, but uh, there is a sort of certain number of people who want to be want to feel they're important, get involved in this kind of thing, and then what they're trying to achieive. You know, what what do they realistically ever expect to achieve with with this sort of thing? And I also think. I know they're trying to represent the fans, but I think you can't really represent the great body of any club's fans, including some of the fans. It's such a disparate set of people, season mm-hmm. ticket holders of different sorts, people who dip in and out, uh, people with family connections. and You kind of think, well, 
at the end of the day, what, what we want is for the team to do well. That's it, basically. It, once the team are doing well, all the other stuff that fans complain about, it doesn't really matter very much, like what the name of the bars are on the ground, all this kind of mm. stuff. No one really cares. When the team aren't doing well, everyone moans about everything. But it's it's not really the main issue. <laughs> so I don't know. I'd be interested to see what happens, but I personally don't think anything will ever come out of that. Mm. Johnny Goldsmith, Red Might Army, yay yeah or nay? Um, yeah, I guess. Uh, similar to... Um, you mentioned there mark it's just to do with like um i appreciate what they want to do uh they're obviously passionate about Sunderland and they want to find out what's wrong maybe try to help out in some way do something to contribute but they're not really going to get very far with trying to contact the club and trying to like see what's going on or um uh, i think if they've got contrast if they've all got like the same sort of view like if they're all pro Chris Coleman then there's a lot of fans out there who probably want him gone so they're not going to listen to them um, and I mean it's it's good to have people like this um, trying to get involved but it's just it's not really going to do anything I don't think mm. interesting interesting we'll look on to the Leeds game now Leeds are in 12th on 53 points um, the recent form has been poor the managers are narrow 2 on defeat over Bolton managed a narrow managed, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what Gav's written in the, in the notes here they managed a narrow 2 on defeat over Bolt Wanderers on Good Friday. Um, they play Fulham tonight. By the time this goes up, people will probably already know what the result is. Um, they're well safe. They can concentrate on finishing the season strongly, really. How do you think we'll do? But to be fair, they're a really poor team. Um, I don't actually... I mean, they were quite good at the Stephen Light earlier this year. Um, the beat were 2-0. But every time I've seen them since, I don't think they're any great shakes. I've actually got a cousin who's a Leeds fan and he doesn't think they're any great shakes. Um, well, our, our friend Nesta, who yeah. we go to university with, is an ardent Leeds, Leeds fan, and he he doesn't rate them at all. So they've got a chance, and I think they're poor at home. Uh, they, they've thrown away some results this year. Like I mean, I'm, I'm sure they were getting beat three one against Millwall, down to ten men, brought back a three three, and then Millwall won it in the last minute. Like <laughs> things like that have been happening at Leeds, and I think they're possibly the team who might go down next year. They might be similar to us, the big fish that goes down. Do you think? Yeah, because to be honest, uh, they've they've bought in a lot of. I don't know, just too many uh, flair players. You know, too many players like Sam who says like they've got a team of players that I'd never heard of until this year, and that might just be me being a idiot who doesn't know now about football. But I don't know. I just don't. I just don't think they're a great team. Well, I mean, obviously they can well beat us because we're really <laughs> poor. But I think you know, it's a, it's a chance to win. They're not good. Mm-hmm. I'll go for a draw, followed by the defeat at home. Um, because it's just as I say, it's something doing something. They'll uh, get a draw because they're away from home, and then like they'll probably get points out of most of the away games, just non nothing from home. Mm. And that's my concern. And I think like I don't really watch Leeds. I haven't really seen what they've been doing the season. But twelfth place, nothing to play for really. So we can maybe take advantage of that. But um, some of them don't usually do that. Is there any <laughs> hope? Is there any hope, Mark at all? The big gamble Coleman made, I think, was was to put so much emphasis on the game on Monday and build that up with the players and everything. And that being lost, I wonder what the reaction is of the of the squad. And if they they think they're now down, what sort of performance we're going to get out of it? I mean, uh, <laughs> I think. Think any worse? Do you remember <laughs> officially relegated and then beat Hull two 0 the week after? Yeah. Well, you, yeah, yeah you just head and all this. You, you, <laughs> yes. you can't. You just can't, you just can't tell, can you? I, I think a draw is from 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 all that we've said really sounds most likely. Two two poor teams. Not really going anywhere in different ways. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned Chris Coleman's comments because I never really thought about the fact that he essentially said, "This is the last chance. This yeah. is the Come along, this is it, support, yeah. and like, therefore, he has sort of accepted relegation." And to be fair, I mean, I don't know what your views were on the the rallying cry. Were we all? I, I was suitably rallied. <laughs> I don't know if yous were. Do you think it's good? I, I, was, yeah. I wasn't. I wasn't like suitably rallied from the rallying cry or call. I was. I was rallied from the win. Really, yeah. Um, if if it had just been a rallying call after another defeat, I would have been. So it just shows what winning can do, really, doesn't it? I mean, I, I respect the man for, for taking the job and and trying to unite us as a fan base, and I reckon he will do so eventually, but not at the moment. I think he was trying to get the players to overcome that fear of playing at home mm. and trying to say, look, everyone's going to be massively on your side, and you know we're all going to go for it. Mm. And I think I think it, it was another gamble, and I think I can see why he did it, um, but it. It has backfired because we're lost, and like it does now sound like he's saying that's it, we're finished. Mm. Um, I doubt that was his intention. No, I think it was that was the gamble. Was that yeah. I, he probably thought it through, um, mm. but he he's he's gone for it, and you know we didn't win. Mm. 
What sort of team would you pick? What formations would you use? Well, it doesn't matter. It's just, pointless uh, even talking about formations. The thing is, is, I've been advocating for the back and then it worked against Derby and then on... I suppose it nearly worked against Sheffield Wednesday. Just for the banter, I'd go with like, the old school 37 cup winning team formation. I'd go like with inside left, so I'd go with like three <laughs> mid Five up. Yeah, 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 five up the top, three central defenders and just, just see what happens. I'll I'll do t- what that lad says on BBC Newcastle, play 4-4-2. Four, 4-4 four, you know, four, fucking two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Imagine, back I've got my a, reputation being the mic bastard. Yeah, crazy so. formations though. If you know, a team like Real Madrid or Barcelona actually went, you know, I'm just going to play with four strikers today. Because that would like bamboozle teams <laughs> in like tactical European battles. Four strikers. Yeah, if like <laughs> Mourinho went, say, you know, in the Champions League against Sevilla, instead of being defensive, he just went, do you know what, I'm going to play Rashford, Marshall, Lukaku, Ibrahimovic, Lingard, and then just play some defenders. Mourinho's the type of manager that would play all of those players at like right back. <laughs> just to come so like that. Like Advocate playing Jimmy before left back against Arsenal. Uh, see, you always criticise that. Well, that was a fucking masterstroke. That I was there. He played that, well. He was it was ridiculous. He, he offered. It was a great outlet on the left. I remember the. Uh, oh, I think it might have been Jimmy Redknapp who was covering the game, being like, "Well, you know, he's a good footballer, isn't he? He can do that." And I was like, "Do you know what? Funny enough." It shows how bad we were that you know we could play our striker left back and he was still the best player. It wasn't necessarily evil. We needed a point and to get the point we needed to play two banks of four. So. Uh, that, I think it was two banks of five to be fair. <laughs> Who were playing Danny Graham up front? I think so, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, oh, so. That was not Toy Vanilla or something, man. Might have been my ass was twitching for most of that. No, <laughs> Toy Vanilla was there the next year. Oh, right. Toy was there under Allardyce because oh, didn't he yeah. score against Villa or something in the last minute? Uh, well, I'll I'll get he scored against City in the Cup or something. Go yeah, four, one. <laughs> but you're an ad- advocate of uh, a dick advocate of playing um, McGeady and getting our creative players more yeah. involved. Are you still are you still for? I'm, that I'm still for that. I still believe that uh, shoehorning players into a system that they're clearly not good enough for is idiotic, and I'll stand by that until we are at the top echelons of the Premier League. Playing five three two or three five two is just stupid unless you've got talented players. You've got to have good le- a good left wing back, a good right wing back, and you've got to have midfielders that are willing to cover them when they bomb forward. Yeah, but to play four at the back, you've got to have good left backs and good right backs, and we don't have that No, either, you, so. you don't know. The thing is, though, that you don't necessarily. All you need for four four two because you've got the extra man. Like, it, it balances the team more. A left back and right back, like Tony Pulis like, does it, where he plays centre backs at left and right back. It not really matter. Are we basically yeah, but um, sometimes decent footballers or more decent than we've got now? Uh, Mark Wilson was yeah. his left back for a while at Stoke. Yeah, yeah. Well, he was decent back then, though. Next season, are we going to be basically playing the under-23 team as the first team? Well, possibly, and it might work. No, we need, we, need, we need to bring a few old lags in from who know League to One. To be fair, James Vaughan one could be a good yeah. side. <laughs> <laughs> you know what we need? We need, um, we need a Graham Kavanagh. Yeah, like, when, exactly. When, when he came in and just looked yeah. really, really strong. Yeah. And John right John McPhail when he went down to third division was mm. immense as a centre half. I mean, he would never have played at a higher level. He was a massive kind of just organised, just shouted at people. But he was brilliant at that level. Who who were the stars of that team? Because obviously I wasn't I wasn't born. So uh, obviously Gary Bennett was kicking around. Well, I mean, yeah, so p- people like Bennett, um, Gates, was who was rubbish in the second division, was kind of reinvigorated. Gabbiadini obviously came mm. in and was a big sign, and McPhail. Um, there was kids like Paul Lemon who were rubbish, but they were like they ran around a lot and they were quite a good, yeah. uh, quite a good creative outlet at that point. And he brought in um, uh, Colin Pascal late in the season. He was good as well, like a McGeady sort of uh, player actually. Um, but better, but better. But basically, you just have to have that. You have to have that solid spine. You can play a few twenty-one year olds and all, all the rest of it. Like Gary Hours came in and mm. that was his first season uh, playing for someone. Gordon Armstrong was actually good at that level sorry Gordon. I think we'll end up um, with a few like cult heroes from next season in the yeah. John, John Kay was the other one he brought John in John Kay, Kay yeah, uh, and he was he was hopeless at first but then it suddenly clicked mm. and uh, it just took a little while but um, you need to have that experience of players who know what League One's about and can uh, can just shore things up because mm-hmm. it won't be pretty no <laughs> it's not pretty now yeah. has it ever been pretty I don't think it was even pretty in the Premier League maybe under Poirier for a couple of months oh, we've had the odd bit of pretty but uh, I like that it's pretty that's yeah, we yeah. so just turned that on there. Allardyce is pretty. <laughs> <laughs> He's really pretty. Towards the back end of that season where he kept us up, we were playing some nice stuff. Yeah, yeah. Chelsea 3 yeah. 2. Mm, that was that was I'm going to go around the table and get some score predictions, please. I will start with John. 1 um, 1. 1 one. One, 1. Connor? I think we'll get humped 4 1. 4 1. Even though I said we could win because Leeds are shit. 
Mark? Uh, three each. Neither side can defend. Oh, nice. We we pour forwards. It's just carnage. To be fair, we don't really score that much. I know we scored four the other day, but we've been blanked like nine times this year. I'm going to go 1-0 to Sunderland just, oh. just to be that guy that puts his <laughs> neck on the parapet. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> right, as always, a big thanks to our guests, Connor, Johnny, and of course, Mark, thank you for coming in. It's been a pleasure. Would you Would you like to come back sometime? Oh, I definitely, yeah. Good stuff, good stuff. Remember to su- uh, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Acast, and follow Broker Report on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Um, we're also on YouTube where you'll be able to catch the latest episode of Rugger Report TV. I will be coming back onto that with Connor at some point. Probably next week. I just can't be asked to go all the way through to Blythe, really, at the moment. Can't be asked to sit in my car and <laughs> get a lift all the way to Blythe. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's you, I don't really want to spend time with you. Is that what it is? Uh, we don't have to speak. It's actually been nice because, like, I'm not saying I don't like you, but we spend a lot of time with each other, um, with each other at uni and stuff, don't I, we? Um, so, like, these three weeks have been quite... It's like good. a holiday, isn't it? It's like being like a Bromley detox. Yeah, I saw it the other day. Oh, yeah, I remember. We actually had a, a lover's tip earlier days. Yeah, yeah, we all probably tend to have lover's tips at least three times a day, don't we? Right, and also make sure you check out Church Lane Burgers. We'll be going there again in the week and reviewing that again. I can't remember reviewing? what special it is. Reviewing, saying nice things. Is that things. what we do? It is genuinely nice, though. Oh, I went there, actually. Nice. Uh, I went the other week and took um, a couple of my pals. Mm-hmm. Just went, you know, not even for our uh, report burgers. You paid, paid, wow, genuine cash. Nice. What did you get? Uh, I got the cluck and swine, which is the one I was meant uh, to get the previous time uh, around. Very good. Yeah, very good. It's my favourite. Right. Enough about burgers. I've been your host, James Copley. Thank you for listening. See you later. Bye.